Hajbi is from uh, Warsazat and he's Amazir, uh, and Abu Habib is uh, Haratim. Um, and I thank them for sharing their life stories uh, with me, and it is their histories that I center today. So returning to the question, why did Southerners migrate? So the nationalists, to take a step back further, and that, according to national's narrative, right, um, which goes something like this, and I'm doing this in, in very broad strokes, uh, the Protectorate was formalized in 1912 in Morocco. Uh, the geographic boundaries of the Protectorate became formalized between 1934 and 1936. This is when France incorporates the anti-Atlas regions. So I'm talking about, um, and these boundaries get redrawn over time. So from uh, Warzazat to the east, uh, um, to uh, Tata uh, and down to Mahamid al -Ghazlan. Um, and so at the, so the, this region becomes incorporated into the protectorate between 1934 and 1936. Uh, at the same time, development projects were instituted um, or being uh, instituted in northern port cities um, along the eastern coast, Casa, Rabat, and Kenitra, which drew people into cities in search of work. So taken from the French archive, this is the trajectory of migration into, um, or these are the events that sort of bound um, Southerners' um, incorporation into the protectorate geography. By 1936, 257,430, um, so says the archive, people um, migrated from Southern Morocco predominantly into the northern regions of Morocco and to Casablanca specifically. Between 1936 and 1952, 1936 being the date when the Anti-Atlas becomes formally incorporated, more than 25% of the population of the Draa Valley, which is centered primarily within um, the Anti-Atlas, um, leaves the 25% uh, leave the Draa Valley to go to Casablanca. Um, and within that 25%, 16% of those people left the Bani Oasis, and this is where the Heratine population comes from, which we'll turn to um, later on in the discussion. So the narrative is that these people left the anti alice in search for work because there was such a boom in production in port cities, in Casablanca specifically. Um, but this doesn't necessarily answer the question of why so many people live. There was an intensification that happened between 1940 and 1952, um, and it doesn't take into account the kind of activities that were happening in the South. And this is where I turn to Hajbi. Um, Hajbi was born in 1926. He's an Amazigh man um, in Warzazat. And his family was poor, but not any more poor than any other family in, uh, in Warzazat at the time. Uh, and, you know, his family may do with what they have, but there was a difference in, in his life trajectory when the French um, incorporated uh, Warzazat and the remainder of the anti outlets into uh, the in 1936. In order to sort of mitigate their presence and the fact that they requested this foreign power being Samuel Galawi, which who many of you who know Moroccan history might be familiar with, he was one of the lords of the Atlas, sort of infamous for his predations on the Moroccan people, um, those under his powers and those outside of his power power who he tried to, to dominate. And so the French, in order to um, secure the, the frontier. I mean, that's the primary reason why they engaged the anti atlas in the first place. Um, and so in order to secure those frontiers, they instituted this formal power um, onto the populations of the, of the anti atlas And so what happened? So in order to mitigate against the predations of Tami al Galawi, uh, they, they decided that they would inaugurate the kinds of development projects that were underway in Casablanca and elsewhere, that they would try to do something akin to that in southern Morocco. So they built roads, they developed the technological infrastructure, they built schools, they did a number of noble things, right? But the reasons for that, but how were they able to supply the labor to undertake these noble efforts, which is how they described it in, uh, in the archive. They recruited, um, and I shouldn't say recruited, they relied on forced labor. And Hajbi and thousands of other Moroccans were conscripted, were forced into these forced labor projects to build roads that people would travel, you know, up to 100 kilometers 
um, you know, they would be, be woken up early in the morning, be forced to walk hundreds of, hundreds of kilometers to build roads, to dig trenches, to improve the water infrastructure. You know, before the French came to the Antialis, there were no roads. I mean, when I say no roads, I meant um, asphalted routes. There were no modern communication technologies. They, those didn't exist. So they, in effect, built the modern infrastructure that exists um, in the Antialis today. Um, and in doing so, they relied on forced labor. But it wasn't just that they relied on forced labor, it was they were brutal. You know, they put people in prison who tried to resist being caught up into this practice. Uh, they took a number of, any number of reprisals against people, beatings, putting them in jail, uh, et cetera. Some people decided to flee elsewhere into the anti atlas with relatives, but that was hardly, um, you know, a kind of remedy because the Galawis existed everywhere. And so other people like Hajbi decided that the best way to escape this kind of cruelty, this kind of oppression, was to flee to the anti atlas So not an insignificant number of the people that end up in Casablanca flee the anti atlas because of this experience. And so it isn't only because they were interested in migrating for the economic opportunities that were certainly available in Casablanca, but it's also that they were fleeing the oppression that they were experiencing underneath French colonialism. Hajbi left forces at between 1946 and 1948, some thereabouts. And he immediately begins to participate in nationalist protests. He remembers um, chanting, Ya Ya al Malik, Ash al Malik, Belek, Ya Faransa, Nodu, <laughs> you know, like, long live the king, get out of here, France, we don't need you, things like that. And so the idea that people who would have left the anti atlas places like Wars is that, in 1946 or 1948 and become immediately incorporated or mobilized into nationalist protest in Casablanca because of the experiences that they had in um, Casablanca exclusively didn't quite sit well with me um, and doesn't sit when taken together with the experiences of people um, like Hajbi. And it wasn't just Hajbi, I mean, his wife, Zahra, also became incorporated or became involved, if you will, in uh, nationalism in Morocco. That's, that's a good point because that's actually my point of course, because as in the Moroccan nationalist movement, the female or women's role in the decolonization process is usually or rarely mentioned and usually marginalized or left aside. Um, and according to your research, what was the role of like poor class women, like the normal women in the decolonization process and the nationalist movement? Um, yeah, thank you. That's a really important question. And so um, I would have to say that you're right, that it's not well um, researched the role of uh, Moroccan uh, women in particular in, uh, in their engagement in the nationalist uh, movement. I would say that um, there are a number of scholars, when I say two that I know of, um, who engage in this manner. And Zahra represents the story of ordinary Moroccan women, non elite women. So the story of elite women is more well known. Zahra was born in Espi and came to live in Casablanca because according to her, and she was very fond of telling this story, that her cousin, one of her aunts, relatives knew of Abu Habib and they saw him and thought he was a good match for her. And so um, she went to, to Kaza to meet with him. They fell in love and they got married there. I think this was around 1952 or 1953. They're not quite sure precisely on the date. But what they do mark, um, and her in particular, uh, what she marks is the fact that she was pregnant while she was in Casablanca. And she remembers engaging in protests in the streets with Hajbi while she was pregnant with the first of their 10 children, which they were very, yes, they had, they had 10 children. They're very proud of that fact. And so Zahra did a number of really courageous things from my perspective, not least among them is that the fact that she was pregnant and also engaged in protests in the street, which was not an insignificant thing to do in general, let alone pregnant. 
Um, you know, the French would violently repress some of these uh, protesters, and they remember on occasion having to serve as kind of triage emergency doctors when the French would shoot and um, injure, sometimes leading to death, protesters in the street. They would bring them to, to a local mosque and try to treat their wounds. And for the people who succumb to these wounds, they would um, attempt to the kinds of the kinds of surveillance that the French had instituted at the time, preventing people from going out at, at certain points um, uh, after protests, the kinds of curfews, excuse me, that the French uh, the French had instituted, sort of prevented uh, Zahra, Abu Habib, and Hajbi, and others like them from burying the dead according to uh, the Islamic burial rites. And so Zahra's story, and one of the things I'd like to point out here that typically when we talk about ordinary uh, peoples and in particular women's role in the nationalist movement, we have this bifurcation of participation. So elite women's participation is termed as nationalist and ordinary folks and ordinary women's protests are termed as armed resistance. Zahra didn't you know, see, see this dichotomy with her engagement in the process of decolonization. Her efforts, like her husband's, they viewed as nationalists, even if they were engaging in armed resistance, which is a thing that she also engaged in as well. She recalls herself and some of, you know, her friends that she knew who would hide weapons underneath the jalaba or their clothing and to pretend as though they were pregnant. And this is a tactic that we see elsewhere in North Africa, Algerian women um, uh, engage in this kind of tactic um, as well. So they were, they were as participatory in armed resistance and nationalism in the process of decolonization as were men and as were elite women. And they, all of this comprises nationalism from their perspective. But their story as Amazigh from the South is just one type of marginality that I engage with in my dissertation and that I will talk. The Heritin are another example of a sort of like social marginalization within geographic uh, provincialization. That's a good point. Again, because it leads into my question and this is an interesting thing. But for that, I just want to tell the audience because I forgot to mention in the beginning that if you have questions, please feel free to them to me in the chat box and uh, we will have a q a session afterwards um yeah so coming back to your points, moya um you just made a very interesting and thematic probably term which is the hierarchy uh, i think that a lot of our audience especially in our would want to know more about the hierarchy and who are the hierarchy in the first place because we hear about the and people hear about them in Morocco, probably abroad, but I think that a lot of people would want to know who are the Haratin and who is the Haratin. Um, Haratin is a really um, charred terminology that it's, it's a bit difficult to pin down. According to academic consensus, these are the indigenous population to Morocco, I dare say, um, and specifically to the anti atlas um, a majority of the Haratin are Amazigh speaking, meaning they speak uh, Shulu from the, the, uh, the uh, Tamazigh, right? Um, but some do also um, speak Arabic, identify as, as Arab. The thing that with which I engage, right, is the history of, of slavery as it relates to the Haratin. I'm sure many of you must be aware of uh, Shakil Hamel's um, wonderful book, Black Morocco. Um, and in which he sort of details the racialization of Haritin in pre-modern uh, Morocco. But for me, you know, there are different geographies that work in Morocco and not to sort of revert to, the, you know, these colonial stereotypes, um, dichotomy between Balad al Mahsa and Balad al Sabah. But there is something to be said about the different geographies that, or ge different geographical powers, the Ata were in control in the anti atlas in uh, the 19th and 20th uh, centuries. And so one of the things that I do in my dissertation is to look at how to center the rural economy and to look at the Haratine not as sort of um, descendants of slaves, which is the narrative with which they're mo most usually uh, concerned, but to look at them as actors who engage with different aspects of life in Morocco, chief among them, <laughs> for this talk um, of uh, nationalism. 
So in the case of Abu Habib, who I spoke about earlier, um, is one of the, the people, he's had a team from Zagora, and he's one of the people with whom I conducted oral history interviews to get a better sense about their participation in the process of decolonization. Now, he was born in 1936, so he was a little bit too young um, to have engaged in nationalist activities in the ways in which Hajbi and Zahra did. Despite that, however, his family did, and I think it's really important to situate the Heratine in this context, um, his family left Zagora when the Galawis were put in power by the French, left the anti atlas and went to Rabat. Um, they only spent a few years, however, but according to uh, Abu Habib, um, they were witness to the kinds of nationalist protests that were happening in, in Casablanca. He was too young at the time to remember exactly what sort of engagement um, people were having, but no doubt they must have been engaged. Their, his family worked as sugar weighers and when they left Casablanca. Um, they went to Rabat and they also worked with a Nisrani, a foreigner, but he wasn't quite sure about what they were discussing. But the important thing about Abu Habib's story is that his family did not simply stay, and this is the same for Hajbi as well, that they were not disconnected from the anti atlas or the going on. Abu Habib's family went back to Zagora in the 1940s. And so there's this kind of narrative about Southern Moroccans and their engagement with nationalism. On the one hand, it's this narrative that, you know, the people in the anti-atlas were disconnected, disengaged, and cared little about what was happening in northern Morocco um, and didn't know anything about nationalism. Um, and on the other hand, it seems as though that once people left these places, disparate places from which they came into Casablanca, Rabat, and Kinitra and elsewhere, that they uh, suddenly, they're sort of it's as if this sort of social death happened to them, that their experiences in those regions didn't matter anymore. And so to sh demonstrate the kind of mobility and movement that was happening between these, you know, disparate regions, um, you know, I'm able to show that not only were Southerners who emigrated to Casablanca deeply engaged with the process of decolonization, but also that there was connection, there, were, there was conversation happening between the people. You know, some people emigrated, stayed for a few years, as in the case of Abu Habib, and went back to Zalawara, and then they returned again to a sort of cyclical migration to Casablanca. So there was constant flow of ideas um, and movement of peoples in that period. So Southern Moroccans did care about nationalism, did care about protest, and this, the anti-Atlas region and the far south were not separate from this conversation. Um, that, that's, that's a very interesting. When you talked about the flow of ideas and, and the mm -hmm. conversation between people and between regions, those southerners or southerners who came to Casablanca earlier, did they engage in recruiting other newcomers from the south who they knew or who they got to know in Casablanca in the nationalist um, I would say that is certainly the case. There's one really clear moment, and I'll speak about this with regards to the Heratine. There's one clear moment. I keep scouring the archives more, though I'm, I'm not wholly dependent upon it, um, as per my early, earlier critique of the archive. But there's one clear moment that I have discovered so far about the ways in which uh, the Heratine, um, as emblematic, if you will, of Southern Moroccans' participation in um, and possible recruitment of other people into nationalist protests. So there's this Captain Moreau who, in 1955, hurriedly, and so this actually points to the, the point that I've made earlier about the erasure and marginalization of, of the erasure and geographic marginalization of the province of Southern Morocco, but also of these marginalized communities that um, in 1955, he hardly writes a sort of short history. It's about 23 pages or so to Rabat, you know, the colonial authorities in Rabat saying, ah, you know, there, there isn't very much known about this community, but I see them, the Heratine, but I see them everywhere in at the forefront of nationalist protests in Casablanca. Every sort of violent protest that the Istiklal organizes, there you have the Heratine at the forefront, you know. Um, and so while he doesn't go into very detailed efforts about the kinds of things that they were doing at the forefront, that they are so visible to this colonial official points 
to the fact that there was sustained engagement. Now, the reason why we can't see this and the reason why this colonial official is writing so late, I mean, from obviously this is sort of a theological, theological statement, but so late, right? As we know, the, the protectorate ends in 1956. But when there's already been so much turmoil in Morocco so late to point that we really do need to know more about this group of people from the anti atlas who we have not really engaged with before, points, I think, even if he doesn't say so explicitly, to the kinds of deep engagement that the Heratine were having. But to answer your question directly, um, Al Alam, which is one of the newspapers that was popular during this period, did have um, at least one announcement to, I don't remember exactly how it's worded right now at this moment, but um, they did try to have a sort of recruitment fair, if you will, for recent migrants. Yes, they, they sort of made uh, announcements in the newspaper for recent migrants. And this was happening in the late 1940s. Um, and so I'm Perhaps, you know, the Heratian, and it's this region that people are still migrating from in the 1940s. So it is very likely that they would have seen these announcements and been engaged. But a lot of these migrants that come from the anti atlas the Heratian, end up in Ben Messiaq, which is one of the sort of shanty towns that emerge um, in the 1920s in Casablanca. And I cannot imagine that there wouldn't have been conversations, um, how else? would they have been organizing street protests, et cetera, that there, there would have been conversation in these very tightly, densely populated uh, spaces. Um, it's very nice to see that uh, you mentioned al -Ala. Do we have mm -hmm. any, any people from the South or Martin who might have participated in the administrative and intellectual work of the Iqlal movement, the independence movement? Um, so within northern Morocco, I don't have any definitive answers about that. There were southerners who were uh, um, involved in the Istiqlal movement. Um, there were people who joined the party. But importantly, the, the kinds of engagement, sustained engagement that you see is in armed resistance. And that takes place in the south, which again sort of rubs against the idea that southern Moroccans were not uh, engaged in nationalism. Um, in the process of decolonization. But because I don't center the istiqlal at all in my narrative, I think that one of the important things that Hajbi said during his, his interview is that, you know, we didn't wait for the istiqlal to come to us and say, you know, the French has done this bad thing, or you should think these ideas about nationalism, or you should be engaged in this kind of way. No, they went out. Their experiences in southern Morocco were enough to mobilize them and to prompt them to go into the streets and de demand um, their dignity, which is what he said that um, was the prime uh, mover and motivator for him in particular. Yeah, that's a great point, actually. Um, this point I've actually mentioned a little bit, but I want to uh, go back to it a little bit. So we know that the Haratin were involved in the real physical work outside, uh, confrontations, protests, and so on. So how did Southern Moroccans, and especially Haratin, contribute to the politics of decolonization? Besides this work and demonstrations, what other aspects of their work? they contribute to the world? Um, so I don't actually have, as I mentioned before, you know, okay, so it's an important thing to note that the literacy rate in Southern Morocco is not very high um, at the time. No doubt there were people who were literate, but um, I think that the, the way you frame the question is interesting because I think it runs against as well this kind of idea that one kind of participation is more significant than the other. And I, I don't know if, that, if you meant this intentionally, but I think the point that I'm trying to emphasize here is that the kinds of broad-based mass protests that you have Heratine and other Southern Moroccans engaging in, in the streets, right? are just as significant to the process of decolonization as were the, the political um, aspects of decolonization that parties such as the Istiqlal, the Independence Party, were engaged in. And that is the thrust 
of the point that I'm trying to make here, that when you only look at the political engagement, which in and of itself, in some ways, a kind of colonial perspective about engagement, right? So the French had this idea that because the Istiklal didn't have as much support as they did um, before the 1950s, that the rest of the, the Moroccan population were not, were supportive of the protectorate and were not on board for nationalist protests. But when you see people like Hajbi and Abu Habib and, and other nameless Haritian that Captain Moreau signals to in his you know, hurried description of this group in Casablanca, it's a point to say that, let's look at these people as well. No, they're not writing treatises to the French. No, they're not, you know, French educated or what have you, but they affect the protectorate as deeply as do these other, you know, elite figures. Interesting. Um, uh, you mentioned earlier, let me, I like to always uh, switch between uh, positions or, or stages. So you mentioned earlier the flow of ideas between Casablanca on the one hand and the rest of Morocco on the, on the other hand, and it is through migrants or migrants who, who kept moving. So we know that there were some people who migrated to Casablanca and then back to the south, and so we are talking about the south. Did these southerners who went back to the south from Casablanca and let me always emphasize the southeast uh, from Casablanca. So did they bring ideas of resistance strategy? Did they implement them, if so, in the south? And do we have any access to that? Um, so to your point about the southeast, yes, it is the southeast. <laughs> um, but in the archive, there are plenty of accounts of what happens in the southwest. Um, there are, there's one account, and I think that this is for some other scholar to do the work on, um, about grocers, grocers from Agadir, so the, the owners of the Hanout, um, sort of um, bodegas in uh, Casablanca, they were the ones that were engaging in translation of documents for people who couldn't read. So, I mean, this is sort of a rumor that the French heard, but if we know anything about the French, they were so deeply embedded in, <laughs> or attempted to be embedded in, um, um, in these kinds of networks that, you know, perhaps there is something to it. Um, and there are also accounts of um, resistance uh, movements in um, the Tefilet. There's a dossier that's full, um, that accounts, you know, of um, different bombings and um, attacks that, that, that resistance fighters in the Tefilet undertook um, against the French in the 1940s and 1950s. But yes, Southern Moroccans did bring back ideas of resistance. But I would say that this points to something earlier that I discussed in the dissertation, that I think it's kind of myopic to suggest that, that it's only the ideas that, or the strategies that Southerners um, learn in Northern Morocco that they deploy when they return to the South. There are already strategies in place. For example, the Haritians, so they engage the Eight Atta. This is the tribe that is sort of in, was in power or is in power in the 19th and 20th century Morocco, who they engage sort of in, in a kind of patron-client relationship with this tribe. And one of the things that they, they employ strategically to gain better terms for this as patrons of a partic one partic particular tribe versus another is that they would choose every so often to uh, conduct the biha, which is they would slaughter a sheep or, or, or what have you, and as a symbol of changing one patron for another. And so I argue that there is a sort of, obviously there are modern strategies that they develop um, and that they learn in, in Casablanca, but that when you look at sites of resistance in Southern Morocco, that you see a kind of continuation of these tactics interspliced with the kinds of strategies that they learn and develop in, in Northern Morocco. But thank you. 